Um, welcome back, and uh, just introduce you to the last session uh, of the day, and it's uh, going to be chaired by John Calvert, who you've seen already, um, and he's going to be talking about getting value from IP. Um, so actually, the, the subject really we're going to talk about is IP finance, so that's one of the um, topics that we have, have been given to discuss. Um, and maybe I'll start with Chris and just ask him to give some examples of IP finance or types of IP finance that he's come across and then we'll start to drill down and, and pick one or two of those to, to explore with the panel. So in your agenda it says that you're going to allow us to introduce ourselves first. Is that we've been eliminated to having that privilege? Well, well, Chris... Yeah. Um, you don't need any introduction. I don't, but, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Justino does, though. I certainly do. Well, I think he's going to go, he's going to go next, Chris. Okay, fine. Yeah. All right. So oh, you know yeah. who I am. I'm the troublemaker on the panel. Um, You're fitting the role nicely. Yes, yeah. uh, that's yeah. uh, born to it. Um, so, uh, one of the original titles that we had for this session I thought you were going to introduce yourself. Just, you know, come <laughs> on. Do no, <I'm> <laughs> uh, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. I'd, li I'd like you to. Who's on first base? Uh, okay, I'll go. I'll go, I'll go. So, now, my, my, my name is Justina De Sanctis. I am uh, an attorney uh, of training. I uh, practice uh, IP law for a number of years uh, and uh, always uh, uh, with the licensing spin on it. Uh, and then after being in house for a number of years, first in Italy and then in the United States, then I uh, joined uh, uh, an IP licensing company, uh, became CEO of the company, uh, uh, name was Sisvel, I ran it until 2013, and then uh, most recently I founded uh, Vectis IP, uh, it's a business here in, uh, in town, and the focus is exclusively in helping uh, companies in licensing their, their, uh, their IP and technology. That's it. Right, Chris. I'm Chris Donegan. I'm troublemaker. Once told by a uh, recruitment consultant I'm unemployable, so I work for myself. Um, <laughs> and uh, I spent 12 years as a strategy consultant and then an investment banker, and the last 17 years as an entrepreneur. I've been the co-founder of five companies uh, and have yet to have an exit, which is why I'm working for a living. <laughs> um, I know a lot about IP financing, having done and been on the receiving end of it and also um, been a financing partner myself. Um, <coughs> my, my consulting business is called Invention Capital Associates and we are focused primarily on um, IP strategy, particularly as it pertains to financing the financial markets or anything to do with money, um, which is uh, the sort of sharp end of it for us. Gareth. Right, intro again. Just a quick one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Gareth Jones, I look after intellectual property for benevolent AI, uh, and we're using technology to accelerate scientific discovery, particularly drug discovery. Um, I don't know what I can say about IP and sales because I was just dragged onto this panel about two minutes ago. So, uh <laughs> <laughs> But Chris is going to treat you gently. This will so. be fun. <laughs> So, Chris, back to the original question. Thank you for chairing the uh, panel so well. <laughs> um, okay, different so types of IP finance. Yeah, so look, um, any investment is, is IP finance. And uh, I think if you think about the life, cy the life cycle of a company, early stage companies, you know, um, everything you do is IP related it, it, because you don't have anything else, as a uh, panelist mentioned this morning. And I mean that in the broadest sense, not just patents, copyrights, trademarks, registered designs, and so on, but basically human beings, know-how, uh, latent capabilities. Um, and as you go through the life cycle, you, re you reach these valleys of death, these funding squeezes that you get when you know you've got a business and you really started to prove it, but you can't prove it enough that you can get real money. So you have to go to some backstreet lender, which we call IP finance. <laughs> um, and, and it really is a little bit like that. Um, so, I mean, I would say that IP finance breaks down broadly into two buckets and with some, you know, it's, it's a continuum, but there are two big buckets. In the early stage of a company where you've got no revenue and you don't, may not even have a product that's proven its, uh, itself, you, you've essentially got either venture capital or venture funding or maybe some IP funding. And all of these investors or financiers are making a bet that there's an addressable market out there and that you might have some IP that reads into it. And it's, it's a very risky business and as a result the money is very expensive. Um, and to me it, it's all equity really, it's equity risk. And as you go through the company life cycle um, you may reach a point where you've got um, some IP that generates or is directly related to the generation of revenue. Um, or if it's not 
directed to the generation of revenue within your company, you can attribute that IP to the generation of revenue in somebody else's company. Um, and more often than not, it's the latter and not the former, and that's when IP finance can really be useful because there's an addressable market, you know your IP reads into it, you may not be practicing the IP and generating your own revenue, but somebody else's. And that claim on that third party, let's call it infringement, is essentially the collateral for the financing. You may, you may not have to pursue it, but the, the lender knows that if they wanted to right. monetize, they could, they could do so. So for me, there is a continuum, but you really get cut into early stage, which is very much equity, and then late stage, which is looking at the litigation potential of a, of a deployed but not practiced IP. Um, so that's the, that's, now the original notion, of the original title of this speech was I IP financing fantasy or reality. And I think that for me, as we go through this panel, some of it is fantasy and it doesn't exist and it's people hope and wish it did. And some of it is reality, but it's a bit more complicated and expensive uh, than you might like. So maybe if we could um, just talk about the case where, I mean, you talked about these two early stage and late stage, and I guess in, in Gareth's business is a VC funded business that's very high growth and there is that bet being placed on value creation. So it's a, a sort of a carrot rather than a stick kind of incentive in trying to build something valuable. I think the um, second case you talked about is when that IP that was created for primary purpose is no longer really of value to that company but can be leveraged elsewhere because there might be people using those patents or infringing. Um, maybe just, you know, if, if you were um, looking to, as an investor, acquire such IP, could you describe the kind of things that you'd be thinking about from an, invest an investment perspective? Yeah, no, gladly. And, and, and I, I think that, uh, you know, what is important uh, to follow up a little bit on what Chris was saying, it's important to point out is that uh, it's the nature of the IP, uh, 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 the importance of the nature of the IP in early stage. Uh, because I think that, uh, you know, what you find at the end of the, of, the, of the game, if you like, when, you know, late stage, uh, it's what was built at the very beginning. Generally, the value it's created, uh, it's created early on. And one thing that I would like to, to, to underscore on this is that uh, every time an investor looks into a, a, a company, a startup, which has a, a technological aspect to it, so not something that provides services or a different uh, business model, but something which is really based on technology, uh, the, the, the very first uh, 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 you know, analysis that it does is to see you know, how well protected the business is. So it could be well protected because uh, it's protected because of its nature. You know, you're first and you grab uh, a certain amount of market and then gives you a certain strength. You know, think, for example, you know, of, of even a Google. You know, when a Google started, it was so strong from the beginning and better than others. They created uh, so much market and now doesn't need patent to protect itself because, you know, that's, that's what it is. If you need to do a, a, an internet search, you go, you go on a Google or, you know, an app to, or even an, an, uh, an uh, app like Uber. You know, once you have the app there, it's so much big market that doesn't need technology really to, to a pattern to defend itself. But if you're looking at something that basically has a technological uh, uh, aspect to it, then the pattern becomes a very important analysis for the investor because the investor very simply looks at the technology, says, okay, this is a, a, a something interesting which has a potential uh, commercial opportunity. But on top of that, there is a risk that the people who are trying to make a commercial opportunity out of it fail for so many reasons, which is not connecting necessarily with the fact that the technology was good. So if that happens, and what, do you, what you're left with. You're left with the IP. And the IP, it's not only, as, as Chris was very lightly pointing out, it's not only the patents, it could be also know-how developed by the people who are the, uh, inside the company. Uh, it could be trade secret, it could be a, a number of things, but this is really what you are looking at at the moment in which you are looking at, uh, at uh, uh, financing the company. Because, you know, equity at the beginning, you're, you're financing the company, you're putting money into it. And so it's extremely important. And in this case, I would say that uh, IP financing is a real opportunity. Yeah, it's not fantasy. I mean, it's something that happens, that happens every day. There is a little bit of concern that today the patterns are not sufficiently strong. And so this is something that I'm countering more and more with uh, some of the investment that we make or company we work with because there is a concern. You know? The idea of the pattern was, well, I am investing in this. If everything goes you know, bust because the company is not good enough, I still have the patterns. The patterns could 
be sold to other uh, companies. It could be used to, in an infringement in case somebody else was uh, smarter from a commercial way. Uh, they could be used in so many ways. And so that was collateral. It was the collateral to, to invest into the company. If the value pattern goes down, if the company is not sufficiently uh, you know, smart on, on the way that it's used the funds to, 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 to protect their, their, their IP, then, then there is a problem. And then you know, uh, financing becomes a little bit more difficult. One thing that I noticed, and, 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 and it's changed compared perhaps, I would say, five to ten years ago, the five to ten years ago, uh, it was a little bit of a checklist. Do they have patents? Yes. Okay, fine. You know, they have patents. Uh, and a little bit like somebody was talking before on due diligence, you say, you know, well, it's pat uh, fee uh, paid, the new is paid. Okay, check, check. Okay, there is patent position. It was a little bit like that. Today, uh, there is a lot more focus on the quality of the patents. And uh, so, the, were the patents fairly prosecuted? Uh, do they have the right claims? And, and very importantly, do the claims cover the actual products on the market? Because you can have fantastic claims, <laughs> but if they don't cover what is out there, they're completely useless. So, so there is more analysis into that. Uh, there is more attention to that when somebody makes an investment. And I think that that's a sign on one side of maturity. So it's good. It means that we are looking at things as opposed to simply checking. On the other, you know, recognize the fact that today, for a patent to be good, it's really, really tough. I mean, today, the, the, the level that we have to, uh, uh, you know, that they have to go over, it's very, very high. Uh, I'll close with one thing on this, which is interesting. Uh, one of my guys that have been working for me for 20 years is an excellent patent attorney, works exclusively for, for, for me. And a few, you know, months ago was talking to me and says, you know, they don't make patents as good as they used to. You know, <laughs> the patents used to be great. We have all these fantastic patents. Says, you know, the reality of the matter is that the patent, you know, they have not changed significantly. The quality is more or less what it was 20 years ago. But 20 years ago, you know, you see a patent, you know, you say, okay, this, this we can fix. This, yes, well, we have a way to demonstrate this. And today you go, no, 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 no. And so, and so the, 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 we have raised the bar so much and we have done this in such a slow uh, moving way, you know, like when you cook a lobster and, you know, the temperature goes up a little bit, a little bit, and all of a sudden we're in boiling water. And I feel yeah. that we're in boiling water. Yeah. So, uh, you, you, I mean, you're alluding to what the fact that U.S. patents in particular are, are a lot less value because of what's going on in the patent On U.S. System. patents is absolutely, you know, crystal clear. There is no doubt. But I, 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 I think in that also, you know, uh, in Europe, uh, things have become more difficult. There is no doubt. I mean, if I have to compare what it was litigating a patent in Germany, which is a very, you know, now, nowadays is a very common uh, uh, place to litigate, you know, patents I was litigating 20 years ago, you know, it was, it was a lot easier than it is today. It was easier for two reasons. First, because the, legisl the, you know, the, 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 the uh, community has grown. So today, uh, even professionals, are, there is more professionality. So let's face it. I mean, it's it, 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 it is good. I mean, there is more professionality. But also, the bar the bar uh, has gone up. Uh, it, no. it's, it's it's definitely more difficult. So so maybe a question to Chris, following on from that. Given given that the bar has gone up so high, is it? actually possible to seek IP finance against a given portfolio now because if the diligence level's gone higher and are those funds still available? Yeah, I suppose I've got uh, s several answers to that. The first is that it's very uh, industry sector specific. True. So um, in low patent density industries like life sciences, yeah. it's very easy, it's straightforward, it exists, there's good pricing, there are many providers, it's expensive, but it's standard. And you know, I sit, I'm a board observer and a co-founder of three pharma companies, and we financed each of them through patent financing right. uh, related transactions. Um, the the second point I'd make is that um, a couple of years ago, uh, the IP consulting firm Redicura uh, published a report on IP financing, and it had a list of um, mainstream banks, you know, J.P. Morgan, Citibank, Deutsche Bank, and so on. And it showed how many patents were sitting um, in uh, the collateral pools of their um, uh, their lending books. And so I went to see each of the banks and go, went and talked to the high yield desk and the, um, uh, the, the, the the private equity financing groups, and asked them, you know, when they'd taken these patents as collateral, how did they value them? What value did they give to them? And uh, the feedback I got was, "What are you talking about? <laughs> what patents?" And eventually I got into a very good conversation with, with a, one of the um, syndicated loan guys at Deutsche Bank and he, he accepted that actually they did in their syndicated loan have patents as collateral, but essentially because of the banking rules they were useless from a, from a, a capital adequacy standpoint. 
And so they kept them in what he called an abundance of caution strategy. <laughs> um, and so I think you get, in, in that particular uh, way of thinking, you've, you've got a, a series of lending that looks a little bit like <coughs> IP lending, and it's absolutely not IP lending, it's just lending. And there's some IP that happens to be part of the pool. Um, and then the third issue is, you know, for technology, specifically not life sciences and not giant portfolios like Alcatel Luce and, you know, is there any IP lending? And again, it's not all about patents. I think the hardest possible IP lending is patent lending. Sure. In the, te I, the mo most lending I've seen is against trademarks, it's against copyrights, it's against things with cash flow, um, in music, in in publishing, in you know many other industries, consumer products, you know trademark brands, Levi Strauss's revolver. There's a bunch of IP lending that's very mainstream, relatively easy to price, and it's there. But there's some, and, and then there's some exceptional technology lending like the Alcatel revolver. But when you get down to you know technology patents, relatively small portfolios, whether or not they're valuable, it exists, but it's rare. It's incredibly expensive, given the risk-free rate is still practically zero. Um, and you go and talk to someone that really needs money. Usually, they're pre-revenue companies, and which no lender likes. Um, and you you find yourself in a universe of very small number of lenders, with relatively predatory pricing uh, pr approaches very tight covenants, which if you sneeze, you hit, at which point you lose the company. So I think it's a, it's a spectrum of, of uh, potential lenders and types of financing. And if you're lucky and you're in a cash flow generating biotech business, you, you've won the lottery. And if you're in a pre-revenue, relatively small technology business, it's tough going. Yeah. It's, it's, it's basically everything. So what you're really looking for is equity. So if you are in, if you are in that end of the spectrum, you know it it it, it it's equity. Call it uh, you know IP financing. It's uh, it's uh, it, it, it's based on IP, but it's it's equity. I don't think that it's, it's extremely. Well, it's equity risk, risk to me. It's, it's equity, equity risk. risk. It's equity risk. So with all that comes with with equity risk. But even the venture funding guys uh, that will only remember if you do venture funding, it's a it's a form of IP lending. But you only get venture funding if your cap table's got equity in it. And you usually only get venture funding if your cap table's got VC equity in it. And the lending decision, although it looks like it's a secured loan on certain assets, is really a bet that the VC is not going to let their money get liquidated. Um, and so, you know, it, th these things aren't can't be looked at as financing structures. It's a it's a it's a game theory exercise in financing, is what it is. You know, we we've seen actually in, in acting for a bank that provides debt based lending secured against IP, we've seen that situation in that really their credit committee is making a decision based on the P&L of the business and usually these are high growth businesses that aren't quite profitable, so it's about cash flow, it's a cre credit facility they're providing um, and it's secured against the IP and as you say it's secured against all aspects of IP so it's often the code base that may be the most valuable thing the company has. Um, and then they're worried about, well, if the loan defaults, what scenarios might happen and what you know, could they do with that IP to monetize it or to, to get some of that capital back? Well, of course, realizable collateral is what every lender wants. They don't want collateral, they want realizable collateral. The bid offer pricing on IP and technology is a mile wide. Um, and so actually where I've seen it work well is where you've got a highly structured transaction and all these transactions are highly structured. There's no, there's no cookie cutter. Um, a few years ago I was asked to help finance an NPE um, who needed some working capital and they had to, uh, an interesting small portfolio of patents. And um, in th the way in which the transaction eventually got done is that we put in place a contingent purchase agreement with a large Chinese industrial company that, wa that wanted the patents. And essentially what happened was the lender took that agreement as collateral, the loan was made, the $30 million loan, and if that loan defaulted, the assets flipped to the Chinese counterparty and they paid whatever the loan value was. Now the loan had an LTV, so they, they would effectively, in the event of a default, have acquired those assets at a massive discount to where they might have hoped to buy them in the open market. And frankly, in the open market, they've never been able to buy them. It wouldn't have happened, right? Um, so, and that transaction was invisible to the borrower. That hedging transaction was invisible to the borrower. 
So the other thing about IP finance is the, the consequences. <laughs> it's a shady game, right? <laughs> no, no, no. The, the consequences of default are you lose your asset, and then uh, then whoever has it does whatever they want with it because they want to get their money back. It's not, you know, that's that's what it's like. And I think, but I think finding readily realizable collateral in relatively small technology companies is extremely difficult uh, unless you've got a buyer of last resort, for example. Mm. And that's that is one way you can you can hedge those transactions. We, we talked earlier about um, patents being a, an asset that can genuinely be transferred to other owners with a um, relatively simple instrument, a patent assignment agreement, for example. Do you, when someone's IP financing against that, that wider spectrum of IP assets, what, what do you think about other asset classes in terms of their you know, red, returnable, can they be transferred, can that value be extracted by a buyer? You mean in terms of trademarks? Apart from, or? Uh, patent, yeah, patents yeah. are easy to move around. but. Copyright, trademarks, trade yeah, secrets. Just a tra trademark and copyright is just as, e as easy. Uh, trade secret is a lot more complicated, but uh, copyright, uh, primarily these things work on, 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 on trademarks because the trademarks are relatively easy to value and, and you don't have a validity issue most of the time. I mean, very unlikely <laughs> that you have a validity issue. And the problem with patents, frankly, is that uh, it, it's, it's very difficult to, 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 to value them because uh, how sure you are that your patents are valid? You can't represent that. I mean, it's impossible. It just you can't. And how do you know that that in case of infringement the patent will really hold? And how sure you are that the, the devices that you think they are reading on the patent they read on the patent? And, and so this makes the thing so complicated that often remember that when somebody goes to get uh, to tr to look for a loan or uh, it's because he needs the money, right? And generally <laughs> you need the money relatively quickly. <laughs> that's 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 a rule basically, and so now you are there, and you are with an asset that is difficult to value. So what Chris was describing pr uh, earlier, uh, the, the example he was making is a perfect example of how you can sort of know the value of that asset, and m because you pre-monetize them, you know? so so you say okay, you get an opportunity to buy something otherwise you cannot buy, and a price which is convenient, and so all of a sudden you have the financing. That's the financing there. Yeah. The financing was to find s uh, somebody was willing to buy the asset for a certain amount of money. So that, that's the financing, what happened. So the part that, that, that all the, why Chris is referring to <coughs> the fact that you need a, a complex transaction. That's one way. Another way you can do it is to move it, uh, you know, that, that looks like a, 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 you know, a patent uh, 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 financing, but in reality it's something else. So basically you, you put the assets out, but there is some other guarantee that goes with it. And so all of a sudden you say, okay, the patent is just nice to have. Uh, great, but I know that if everything fails and I have something else that, 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 that steps in. That I've seen done many different ways and many different times, but in reality it looks like happy financing, but it's, it's not something really. else. Okay. Um, just a, a question to Gareth, I mean we, took, we, we earlier alluded to the fact that v VC funding is actually a form of IP finance. D do you think in your experience that's, that's really true? Because we've had this comment earlier that a lot of VCs, that even at various stages of finance, don't really look into the IP in, in that much detail. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. I would look at it as, as IP financing. I think I think IP is, is one factor among among many, but most VCs probably wouldn't wouldn't look into it enough detail to, to to be able to argue that it's IP based financing. I think it's it's uh, it's just an element that factors into the the risk and value of the of the loan. So, I mean, really, the VCs investing in at that early stage, surely, Chris, investing in the management team, the promise of the market opportunity that that team can can get them to with a product or service idea. I mean, I mean, apart from knowing that there is some IP in there that somewhat aligns to the business, it's the finance is not really tied to the IP, is it? Yeah, I have the luck of not being either an engineer or a lawyer, so I can use terminology <laughs> in a very loose way. Um, so, you know, there's three things in a company that make sense: there's people, there's platform, there's product. And each three, each one of those three things is IP to me. Right. Yeah. You can have a company with no patent, no trademark, no yeah. copyright, but tons of IP. Absolutely. And it, business model is an IP. Data, it's an IP. Right. So, I, to me, if you're a VC, the only thing you're investing in is IP because you've got nothing else. You've got latent potential to generate value uh, from a set of intangibles that that you're investing in. Whether it's you like that person, you must back them. I'm backing you or whether you think the business model is great or what have you. So to me, in the broadest sense, it's IP, but I agree that it would probably fall through the legal definition of what is IP, right? <laughs> but intangible is, yeah, what, I, is yeah. what I would say. The other thing I think is interesting is that deal structures are very different depending on the industry you're in and the type of IP. So 
you will often see a, uh, a pattern transfer um, and absolute right of transfer, o transfer of ownership of an IP in the tech uh, financing. Whereas in a life science financing, you rarely see that. Um, you, you can keep the pattern in your own name. We don't want to own it. We're essentially, we're going to finance you against the strength of, of the licensing value Correct. that you've got there. So the, the, the sense of what is IP and how tightly I need my hands around you is very different also depending on the industry. Uh, and that can have all sorts of other, I mean, people don't talk about it much, but when you get an IP financing, it, it, there's all sorts of other things that it can impact. Um, for example, if you are transferring your IP, you know, what's the, uh, what's the, does it impact any licenses agreements that you're trying to negotiate, right? Yeah. Does it have a tax consequence because you have to maybe have to move the location of the asset? Um, and th there are various other knock-on effects that you see. And so that, that makes it doubly hard in, in this technology situation. Whereas in life sciences, none of, you don't have to deal with any of that. It's a contractual obligation secured on an asset which you only exercise in the event of default. So, you know, IP financing in tech in, in, the, in, in, in it's very the future, different. it's very different, mm. it's very different. In, in that sort of pharmaceutical industry, you get, uh, and obviously you've got all the experience from the three companies you've, you're, you're on the board of, um, you sort of indicated that that's much easier to price um, or, or easier to be certain. Supply and demand. Right. Well, it's two things, right? Most patents in life science companies, not most, but many are subject to matter patents. You know, you have a molecule, you, you know what it looks like, it's clear. Um, there's an invalidation rate, but it's very low in comparison to tech. Um, and as a result, and, and there's a reasonably good data set of historical licensing outcomes that, that a, a, a lender can you know, look at. Um, and there's a good experience curve. So there's a relatively large number of providers and, and therefore there's a relatively good pricing. So low patent density, fairly well-defined subject matter, relatively large number of, of lenders you know, you still end up at LIBOR plus double digits, uh, but, but you are, you know, you're, you, at least you know what it is. In the tech world, I think all, it's almost every deal is utterly different from what yeah. I've seen, and, you know, and, and it's really specific and really bespoke and really difficult. Um, it can happen, it does happen, um, but it's, because of that, you're dealing with the special projects area of the lender, if it's a traditional lender, or you're dealing with a hedge fund or you're dealing with a you know bespoke lender, and that means there's lots of bells and whistles, and the pricing is very opaque. But frankly, you need the money. So the question yeah. is, how much do you need the money? But, so so I mean, in in life sciences, right, they, because of the low patent density, the patent is almost the product in a lot of cases. There's it, a it, high correlation. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, so there's already existing kind of pricing structures for the product yeah. sense, whereas on the tech side, it's kind of it's an adjacent piece that happens to relate to the to the product. And there's a lot of royalty rate information that's public as well. Hmm. So also in the validity, sorry, also in the validity of the patent, you're a lot more comfortable with a, with a patent connected to a molecule or to a yes. compound or to something that basically you can, you can actually see. And you're right, there is often a one-to-one -one or few-to-one correspondence. It's less likely that you're infringing somebody else's patent. It's easier to understand what happens. The so market's clearer because you probably know the number of likely patients and, and so it, on. It, it is a lot, a lot, a lot easier, absolutely. But then, uh, so in, in, the, in new and emerging areas like immunotherapy and uh, T cells and so on. There's a lot of trade secrets okay. around the area. Yeah. There's a lot less uh, 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 subject patents. It's a lot more trade secret rich, and it's a lot harder to price. And that financing looks very, very similar to technology, um, it, and and starts to look a more, lot more like VC. So, I mean, I guess the only point I really want to make is that there isn't a thing called IP finance. There's, there's, it's very particular for a situation an industry, a sector, and a stage of development of the company. So, but is, is there, I mean, you, the comment made earlier was that the point at which you really need the money, um, you might turn to IP finance, though we don't, you know, that can be lots of different things for different situations. Is it therefore very expensive? Um, or, you know, what stage in a, what, what we, uh, in running a company, what decision considerations would you have in saying, well, now we're going to go down an IP finance route rather than a bank loan or a, a going to a VC? Well, I, I, again, I've come across three motivations for IP and finance. Uh, desperation, delusion, um, <laughs> and, um, you know, a, and a real situation where it's possible that it could actually happen. 
and the first two are about 80% of all cases because they've been turned down by the bank, you know, nobody, the investor's not putting any more money in. Maybe, the, maybe someone on the board says, we should try some IP finance, we have patents. And, and you know, it does, doesn't work, right? It simply doesn't work. Um, but then there are other cases where, where it's a sensible part of the capital structure of the company um, in certain interest rate environments as opposed to desperation and delusion, right? So, in, and it depends again on the company. So if you can finance yourself from, the, from a bank at 9%, there's no way you would go and do an IP finance because you're not getting any cheaper than that. Um, on the other hand, some forms of IP finance, particularly on cash flow producing assets, are a little bit like receivables finance. You're doing a net present value calculation on the future income stream, you're taking the discount, and you know, the all-in cost is maybe mid, you know, six, seven percent, maybe right. something like that, right. on a sort of a roll forward basis. So you have to think about IP finance no different to any other form of finance. You have a capital table, you know what your balance sheet looks like, and there's a level at which maybe there's a certain level of IP finance that makes sense. Particularly if it's IP that you're not really sweating in any other way. Why not get some value out of it is, the, yep. Yep. is sort of the key. Um, but a lot of the time it's delusion or desperation, and in desperation, any price that you're offered is the right price. And in delusion, you're not getting a price. <laughs> <laughs> but I, in the current climate, where I'll say the, the, the strength and value of patents, so we talked about the bio, biotech side, but in, in the tech side, um, the value of patents is down. The sources, the IP fine, they're hard to value. Um, litigation rates are down. NPEs do or don't exist anymore, but there aren't that many that are, have got a successful business model. So, is it something that should be considered at all? I mean, is, is, or is that well dried up? What do you think, Disney? No, I think it, it's not completely dried out. I don't think it's completely dried out because, you know, it, it, it really depends it goes down what assets do you have and, and whether there is any appetite for those assets outside. You know, the example that Chris just gave, you know, you, you just need to find somebody who wants that IP. Which is not so easy, mm -hmm. and, and and obviously the fact that uh, the uh, uh, let's say that the NPE market has, has, has considerably uh, shrunk that obviously doesn't help because that was helping to create some liquidity. So one of the things that the patent market has always suffered from is liquidity. That's been something mm -hmm. that has been forever. I mean, it's not nothing new there. And as soon as we started to have some liquidity, maybe too much, somebody would say, yes. uh, <laughs> you know, we killed it. <laughs> so, 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 so there's something a little bit strange there, but obviously it's a liquidity issue. So if you can find the right, uh, the right uh, 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 purchaser for the asset, then it's, it's not fantasy, it's reality, because now you have a, a, a quite a clear evaluation of what, what it is. Um, so I wouldn't say that. We, we, we did something recently on a, on a, on a, on a bunch, on a company that had, uh, um, uh, you know, and what I'm trying to say here, it's that you don't even need to own the patents. So right. Right. what you really need to have is the rights. So we did recently a, a deal with a company who had collected rights from uh, uh, universities and the universities, mostly American universities, could not sell the patents because uh, they were publicly funded, so they can only give exclusive rights. So this company had exclusive rights, but still was not able to manage to get uh, money because uh, these contracts were overly complicated. And so whoever wanted to get into that, it would just simply look at the contracts and say, oh, I don't really know what rights you have. And so they would just, you know, close the doors. And so what we did is that we went in and we actually worked with university to simplify significantly the agreements to make them a little bit more standard and easy to understand with a lot less uh, uh, caveats and uh, and. Uh, uh, and uh, covenants, uh, and all of a sudden you have uh, IP which was rightly, you know, controlled by this company. Once you, you control the IP, then there was access to investment, and we found investment. There was no how there was uh, technology in there, and all of a sudden we found we found investors, and the company's investing now is up and running and and doing their things. But the the key there was that you know even if uh, you don't need to own the rights, you the, the patents, you need to have sufficient. Uh, uh, you know, rights to demonstrate that you are solid and there is no issues that you know basically can 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 cut the the ability to enforce, the ability to monetize, and so forth. But so you know, it is possible, but you need to find the people who can actually appreciate what the asset is and like, value the, the the asset and and see and see and see the value, which generally means that there is less people that are out there buying, and if there is less people out there, they're buying, the price goes goes down. It's mm. uh, just a matter of offer and, uh, and demand. It's, it's relatively simple, quite frankly. So is that, is that something you would consider when in licensing assets to actually consider future IP financing kind of issues that you might, might arise if the deal was not structured in, in the right way? 
I, I, I think that it's not something which is generally thought, <laughs> you know, but, but I think it's something that should, should be because basically at the end, you know, it's not because of IP, IP financing, but because if an IP financier would not consider, it means there is something wrong. Mm. So to a certain extent, you need to do things right because you want to uh, have the right, the, right, the right thing which will allow you options. This is a discussion that I often have with, often have with, uh, with startups. And, and one of the discussions that I often, very often have is that, you know, they say, okay, we have developed this new technology, fantastic. Okay. I'm talking about tech here. Yeah. I've developed this new technology and all they want to do is to <coughs> have a prototype to show it. And then you ask, so are you gonna, it's your vision to manufacture this? Oh, no, no, we're not gonna manufacture, we're gonna <laughs> license this because, yeah. you know, creating <laughs> a manufacturing. Uh, and so you talk about the patents. Oh, so the patents, we are now thinking how to do that. Yes, we filed, but, you know, and so there, there is something completely wrong there. Why? Because if you really want to have a, 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 an IP model where you are actually getting licenses, your product is not the prototype. Your product is your IP is your patent. And so that's where you need to have the sufficient funds to make sure that your patents are sufficiently good because this is your product. The prototype, you need to go out to the fair and show it and get more people to finance you. But if you don't have your patents in line, you know, you're basically wasting the investment because somebody will come, will say, oh, very nice. Yes, yes, okay, yes, they'll do it. They just do it. Today, there is, that there is very little that you can protect these things. I mean, yeah. If you have a, a team smart enough, you know they can they can you know come up with a lot of those things. So the patents are very very important. Yet I often find uh, startups who, when it comes to the patents, they stay behind because it's too expensive, it's too complicated. But I think that's an important option, an important part, if you are in technology and in what you want to do. It's a licensing business model and not manufacturing, for sure. So the, the example you're talking about there is. Um, working with US universities to I yes. say, cl clean up the license rights to make them more uniform. Yeah. So as a, let's say a single entity, you can get some finance to then go monetize that IP. Um, do, do you think that, is there a difference between US universities and European in the way that they'll give someone free agency to go and monetize that IP? Because in my experience in, in let's say, UK universities, they've got this big reputational concern about their IP being asserted or or being used it, it by a third party in licensing. They, they prefer yeah. to do early stage licensing themselves using their TTO. Yeah, they, they, that's a common uh, concern, actually. It's not, it's not new. Uh, I'd say the US universities are, you know, uh, used to be more concerned about it. And, and, and I'm talking the top names, so the ones that really have a big experience. We are talking about, com you know, universities have a, a TLO office with, uh, you know, dozens of people uh, very well organized and, you know, and generating some revenues. They could do better, quite frankly, but they're generating <laughs> some revenues. Uh, and and they, they used to have a, a very big concern about, uh, you know, reputation. And so you could not sue, you could not do this, you could not do that, and, and so forth. I have to say, if one thing has done this difficult environment is that they're finding themselves that it's so much tougher to see their patents respected that they're willing to do uh, a lot more than they used to. So, for example, in the agreements that I'm talking about, you know, basically at, at the beginning there was no, uh, you know, very uh, difficult right to sue. So basically, you know, they, they, they had to approve uh, uh, litigation, they had to approve this, approve that. So it was very uh, restrictive. And we were able to manage uh, a much, much leaner process where basically the, uh, the, the, the company not only has the right to sue, but the university has to join uh, because in the US, the owner has to join. So the university agrees to join uh, in, in, in the lawsuit. And the reason why is that is because they realize if, that, if they do, you didn't have that, then the asset is it's, it's, it's like having, you know, uh, so, you know, a weapon without uh, being the weapon being armed. I mean, it's it's yeah. absolutely uh, irrelevant. And so that's something that I've seen changing compared, say, five years ago, where they were a lot more reluctant. Right. Uh, now, what is important there is the partner. So the partner has to be credible. The partner has to have a track record. You know, they're not going to do it for the first company that comes, and they are, and, and often they put in place protection for that, mm. so to make sure that the people who they work with have, have you know, certain level of reputation to be defended, and so. That that's that that's important, but they they, they do they do they are a lot more uh, progressive, if you like. So so in that case, they're doing due diligence on you as a service service. They do due diligence on the service or either yeah. the company or whoever is involved. Absolutely, or they finance you for that for that reason. And so if you if you want to bring in money, you know they they're very careful on who who is behind mm. it. Mm. Okay, and so d I mean in that experience, you did you your company have to canvas and 
convince all of those universities co to come on board? Did you have a good success rate in that? Or? Yeah, we had, a, we had a very good success, ra success rate. Uh, it took a little bit of time. Mm. Uh, so it's not something you can do overnight, mm. but uh, it, it's definitely today. I think it's definitely doable. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, funny, funny enough, at the end it was easier to do it with the American university than your European university, which I would have expected exactly the contrary. And the reason why it was difficult with European universities is that uh, the, the TLO, these two universities were uh, uh, in uh, in Germany and in. Uh, uh, in Denmark uh, and in Ireland, uh, is that quite frankly they're, they're strapped for time. So you go there and there's yeah. one guy who has uh, <laughs> to do a thousand things and for as much as he wants to get your job done, uh, you know, he just doesn't have enough capacity and then some of those issues are, you know, if you like, overly complicated mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so they just tend to, to set aside or say, okay, now when, when my uh, outside counsel has a little bit time for me, we're going to look at this. So it was more than anything else, not necessarily a lack of interest in doing it, but it was more, you know, just a, a capacity, quite frankly. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess w one other aspect, Chris, I think in the question earlier you alluded to in, in IP is that a lot of value from IP can be uh, created for, through tax mechanisms. So we've, we've obviously seen a lot in the press um, with companies locating IP in particular jurisdictions to maximise profits and returns in, in, in other jurisdictions, let's say. Um, do you think that's a form of IP financing or...? Well, of course. Yes, it is. Totally. Um, <coughs> You know, I've just, uh, on December the 11th, Tolly's, Tolly's Tax Guide is publishing its transfer pricing book, and I wrote chapter two with Ray Hegarty from That was a IV. shameless plug. I accidentally <laughs> queued him up there. I apologize. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't know much about BEPT before I started that project. And uh, one of the things that it's really interesting is that there's this giant accidental or deliberate misunderstanding from tax authorities about how R&D works and how you know, what you end up with has probably got a lot of survivor bias inherent in it, and that all the projects that didn't work, failed, um, cost you money, and what's the right cost of capital for financing those projects, and, and why do assets sit where they sit? Um, and you know, sometimes there's just a naked opportunism around let's put our IP in the lowest tax jurisdictions, because frankly there weren't any rules that were a problem. Um, and there are certain companies that have done that, but I think most companies are actually have got a compliance department, and they're in the business of trying to be compliant, but also commercial. And the rules are changing quite significantly. And but there's no doubt that that there's a significant financing advantage from you know where you locate your assets because you're going to measure the return on investment on a particular asset, and you're going to measure the post-tax return on investment uh, for an asset. Um, again, in life sciences, the marginal rate of tax for a lot of companies is single digits um, on their assets, and that's because their assets are very carefully planned as to where they hold them, in, close to the market where they're going to be sold, and so on. And there are big pools of capital that are built up as a result in that. And so, yeah, but it, it, in general, an investment, you know, post-tax investment returns are what people should be thinking about, not pre-tax, and the difference can be huge, I mean, massive. So, um, but, I, but you know, I think it's not just about multinationals. There, you know, the, I sit on relatively small company boards where, you know, our turnover is below, you know, a couple of hundred million dollars. And we have a very sophisticated um, holding company structure for where we hold our assets that, you know, takes advantage of all of the benefits that we can gain that are, that's, com that's compliant. Um, and one of the things I've noticed is as you go through the development process, a assets at the early stage of development live in a certain group of people in R&D, and then as they mature and they move into a product and you start selling that product and so on, you actually move things around um, in, in accord with your business strategy. What, around the corporate structure? Yeah. Okay. Um, and well, there's two things that happen. Firstly, you can change cor corporate hold where, they're where they're actually held. But secondly, the control of those assets, which is a, an important factor, also changes materially. And you know, asking yourself a question, uh, where, who adds the most value, the person that invented the asset or the person that sells the product, or the person that creates the marketing strategy, or you know, it's, it's a bit like the old parable about what's the parable that's more important, which is more important, the head or the foot. You know, <laughs> I mean, so I find assigning value, there's a sort of value chain analysis you go through try and figure out where is value generated, how do you price it, and that 
goes back into an ROI calculation for is this asset, is this piece of IP worth something? Are we sweating it? Is it making money for us? Is there additional value we could create from it? And sometimes that leads to, well, should we put some debt finance on this? Mm. And a lot of IP financing that takes place that I've seen outside of the SME context is intercompany, right? right? Where essentially you've got one entity that's, that's funding another and there's a return on that. And that's a very attractive return. And that's often a point of challenge from the revenue authorities. That's Chinese dollars, isn't it? It's just, uh, <laughs> well, you know, it's, 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 it's just, I think I read that 60% of all cash flows globally are intercompany transfers. I mean, of everything. Right? Um, but within a large company, that, that financing is often done way below the rate that a venture capital firm would charge. So I actually think some companies are not charging enough for those internal transactions. Because if you did a real arm's length analysis and asked Index Ventures to go fund that uh, project, they either wouldn't do it or they'd charge you an awful lot of money. Yeah. So yeah, there is definitely an IP financing uh, in terms of where you put assets and, and post-tax analysis of the ROI is, is important. But you know, it can be a little bit existential. Right? It's not mm. quite like I'm a growth company, I've got some good IP, I'm a little bit pre-revenue, I need some capital, I'm in the valley of death, how do I get some funding? Which I think is the big part of what's relevant to, to the sort of SME sector. Yeah, but, but that, yeah, so that, that's hard to get. I mean, I guess you, you talked about the example of the board, boards you sit on. Is there, a, is there any common denominator in terms of size of company or, or revenue size that, above which these, I'll say, corporate structure issues of where you cite your IP for tax reasons matter? Because I imagine, in the, well, I know from chairing an early stage startup, it's not a consideration. It's, there's yeah. a, a single UK com company with its IP. Yeah, it's, it's surprising. So, uh, so one of the things I've written about in the past is this notion that you know, you, as a founder of a company, you have you're schizophrenic, um, at least schizophrenic. Maybe you have more than two personalities. <laughs> and when you go to investors, firstly, you you have an optimism bias and you have a belief in your product and you have an asymmetry of information, which 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 gives you this sense that your asset is very, very, very valuable. And you also don't want dilution. So you convince your investors that you're going to be a billion dollar company, right? and they give you some money on that basis. And you have to support that with some valuation exercise. Yeah. Right? So you create this sort of basis for yourself that you know we're a billion dollar company and this is my plan. And then what always happens is, you know, you're not a billion dollar company. It didn't work out the way that you thought it was going to work out. And actually, it turns out that you need to do some things to solve that problem. And some of those things can result in that original valuation that you started with coming back to haunt you, which is, but you were a billion dollar company and that asset was worth a billion dollars and you've just sold it. And you've got this not giant basis that is attaching to your company now. Uh, even though you've made no money, you owe us $200 million. Could we have a check, please? And the U.S. authorities are a little bit more difficult, I think, in this regard than than, than okay, others. So that's a tax liability. That you've yes. Created. Okay. Right. So, so I'm saying that um, I don't I don't want to get into this discussion about IP value because you can be here forever. Um, but that's going to be my next question. <laughs> <laughs> right. But but if you go to you know different people inside the same company, they will value an asset completely differently for various reasons. Um, so, you know, the guy that wants to raise money, it's worth 10 million. You know, the guy that wants to borrow, the, the guy that wants to um, uh, sell the asset, so that the, the, the patent broker will say that, that, that patent's worth, you know, a million. The patent licensee, licensor will say, no, 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 we could get 10 million in a license agreement, right? Um, and the guy that wants to raise VC money, so no, it's worth 100 million. Because, you know, so everyone has, it's the same asset, right? And I think how you book, record, if you do, anywhere, what those values are, um, can be really important, both in terms of driving organizational behavior uh, and also in terms of creating some liabilities for you that may be a surprise. Um, and I, it, I see it, it's, you don't have to be a multinational. You can be a company that's worth, you know, 30 million and right. still have a 200 million problem. Mm. I'm not saying that's us, but I have seen it. Okay. Well, I think we're uh, we're into the oh, five minutes left, so I, um, I'll probably open out to the audience now for some questions, not for Chris, <laughs> <laughs> or for Chris if we're uh, <laughs> struggling for hands. <laughs> Thank you. 
question. It's the end of the day, John. Okay, uh, so <laughs> what, what time does the bar open? That's a question I've got. <laughs> <laughs> Any further comments from the panel? To end on? Well, one thing I was thinking is, as we were talking was kind of some of the discussions I've used when talking to investors around the value of the assets say if so primarily you're looking for what if the business is successful this is what we want where what kind of assets we want what we want it, that story to look like but on the flip side of that is well let's also consider the scenario where the business isn't successful and yeah. then what are you left with at the end of it and that's kind of a, a strategy in itself and, and that, I guess that comes into some of the points you were talking about IP financing or, or perhaps you know just just pure sales but I think that's something to factor in when you're thinking about that that strategy perhaps it shouldn't be a strong piece to it but perhaps an element to to consider is is what you do with those assets later if you if you don't use them for their primary purpose yeah. one one uh, comment on that from our experience is when we've talked to, to VC we've heard that myth about well if a company fails as a VC well I've got some IP assets I could monetize but once a company goes into administration, the urgency with which you're trying to monetize those assets is you've got a very short window mm, to, to create value. And most times you don't get value from that IP. So I think in our experience, we've seen most VCs completely discount the IP, even the patents from a, um, a perspective of could we create value in the event of default because they are only betting on the the team and the growth and the opportunity, but they're but they're placing multiple bets. So, yeah, they're not all going to need to be successful for them to get a good return for their investors. Have yeah, I just one on the comment, but you're going to disagree with me anyway. No, no, don't you worry. <laughs> but I think there is a situation though where that IP can be valuable and is valuable. Um, but I think it's much more after the fact. It's probably changed hands at the point mm. of. Um, it's been in administration, someone may have mopped it up. Or in, we've seen in the US, maybe the original founders have somehow ended up with the IP again because it's of zero value or little value and they've sort of bought it back for a very low price and then they've started the company again or they've done something else with it. Now, what I want to say is that I basically, no, in, in principle, I agree with you. I mean, that this is the reality. Very rarely you can actually monetize those assets. Mm. So this is, this is true and there's no doubt about it, but this is not what drives people from investing. So you are driven for investing not because 90% of the uh, or 95% of the startup fail, because 5% do not fail. Yeah. So you need those success stories to draw you into investing. So what I'm saying is that you know out of those 95, only five will will make it or maybe less. You know, but those are the ones that drive you. So to a certain extent, <coughs> you need some success stories to bring you know people back to invest into this 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 mm. this so so you know it's true that a lot of them fail and all the time the patents are not good and maybe that the patents that the technology was not good to begin with or there are a thousand reasons why it doesn't mm. work. Mm. But for as long as we have a number of stories that are success stories, we will continue to see people investing into VC, we'll in continue to see people investing in A series, in B series and so forth. But you need to have those 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 good stories to, to carry to carry the baton for everybody else. <coughs> I think the, the, the only thing I'd, I'd like to finish on is to say that um, we, we talked a little bit about IP finance in an abstract, but you know, who are the lenders? Right? Who actually provides this sort of financing? Um, and at, at one level, the banks provide it. You know, um, if you go to the states, for example, Bank of America's SME lending do provide additional funds over and above in a, a cash flow multiple. For companies that have a recognizable brand, trademark, anything at all that, that looks like it could support the income. And that's, that's a very boring commercial banking proposition. Um, uh, some of the Singaporean banks uh, are exploring a similar incremental loan amount, changing the LTV a little bit, if you've got some recognizable IP. It doesn't have to be patents. Um, and then as you move up the sort of risk curve, you've got you know angels and you've got professional people and organizations that are in the same industry that you're in and therefore they feel very comfortable or more comfortable with the subject matter and, and therefore for them this might be part of a, a cooperation agreement or some commercial agreement but they'll also provide finance. So it's not pure IP finance but it's as part of a commercial relationship. And then you get to the sort of pure financiers who are only interested in lending money and there are some boutique you know, bank type lenders but mostly they're hedge funds and sort of VC firms, and it's not hedge fund bad, VC good, or the other way around, but you do tend to sort of find a character type, which is, you know, they're betting that you fail, 
and that's what the lending is done on. Um, and then there's a, a group that would like their money back, and they're hoping that you succeed. And there's a certain flavour to those, you know, types of agreements that are a little bit different. Um, and then the general rules for collateral apply, which is the more diverse and, and your portfolio, the better. The larger your portfolio, the better. Any price points you've got on any of your assets, did you license any? Was there any, you know, uh, valuation on them that, that, that is better? Um, and um, and then certain industries are more a finer price than others, and we, we talked about that before. So, you know, IP financing does exist. It's part of the of the capital structure. It's part of the overall financial makeup of the company. There are lenders out there, depending on who you are, on that life cycle. And I think that, you know, if you've got a good business and you've got good IP, and you can really, in a grown-up way, explain, you know, what you're about, and you look hard enough, it's it's not it doesn't hurt you. Right? Um, it takes between three and nine months to find a good to find a good lender, unless you're a cookie cutter case. And almost no one I've come across is a cookie cutter case. And that's the other issue, which is if you need, if you think you're going to need money, <laughs> you can't just call on Monday and get it on Friday. It's not happening. Um, and then lastly, if there is a possibility with some lenders to put in place a facility, uh, which is based around some covenants and you can draw down on that facility based on performance and based on milestones. So these things do actually exist, but there's a lot of work and they can be structured, but having it in your back pocket can be, can be a good idea. Um, so that, that would be the, if my sort of summary. Right. Well, thank you to the panel. In particular, thank you to Chris, because he said the, uh, the death of an interviewer was to have someone that would answer with just single word answers. And, uh, <laughs> and Chris didn't do that, so thank you very much. <laughs> So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm sure you'll agree we've had some really very interesting and genuinely lively discussions. I won't keep you from drinks for my full 15 minutes. Um, I, was, I thought it was particularly interesting to hear the experiences of various panelists within the SMEs and all the other participants' perspectives of those guys, whether they're providers or investors. Um, so thank you all for, for your contributions to the day. Um, I guess in part it surprised me that we talked so much about whether to patent or not. And obviously there are some, some different factors that come into play on that. I mean, cost being a big one, of course. Um, but depending also on the technical field and, and perhaps not knowing uh, what the benefits are. Um, and I guess the message I got is that there's no one size that fits all. As long as you've thought about it, um, it was that expression, it, it's horses for courses. Um, and patenting may not be the, the right solution. Um, it was also good to hear from some patent-owning SMEs uh, that the benefits that they considered fro flowed from the ownership of patents. And perhaps as patent attorneys, we need to do more at the early stages to actually convince businesses of, of what those benefits are. Um, I think patent attorneys have got something of a hard time today. We won't hold it against you. Um, but again, it, it's good to have an honest conversation. We, we can only progress by having an honest conversation. It's, it was also good to hear that SMEs also valued having a, um, a good relationship and, and trust in that relationship. I mean, I think I probably speak for all the patent attorneys here and probably beyond when we say it's actually particularly interesting and rewarding if, if we can actually get genuinely involved in the business and, and genuinely have input to, to guiding that business. Um, and I'm personally happy to promise to SMEs that we'll get fully involved as long as you promise that when you get large you won't get a procurement department that asks for my lowest price. <laughs> No, but, but very seriously. Um, no, I agree more work is needed in the relationship between us. Um, it's, I think it's in all our interests to have a, a good understanding of each other uh, and to trust one another and to trust that essentially what we're getting out of the relationship is, is balanced and fair on both sides. So just a, f a few other messages that I think came out of the day. Patents aren't the only thing to think about. I mean, for example, trademarks shouldn't be neglected. A, a strong brand is very valuable. And it's easy to overlook that. And you, you certainly don't want to get two years down the line and find you're having to, to undo all the work you've put into it by having to completely change your brand and then convince the market of your new brand. 
And just one final thought, and I think it's something that actually I think Anne McLear of, of IDEX said, that um, I'd initially said that patent, why, why patent? Well, patents give you control. And she said, well, she'd rather look at it as, as patents give you options. So I'll just leave you with that thought. I think patents, to me, are very much about protecting the future. It's very hard to know at the time um, that you're actually applying how valuable that will be, how valuable that patent will be. Um, but it certainly keeps your options open for, for when the business is successful down the line. Um, so thank you very much. We're very happy to continue the conversation um, over a few drinks. Thanks for your time. Much is so true